it's that time of year where, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but you're, you're one of those people that either you're getting to this time of year and you're sort of tired and you're just wishing for this year to end so that the new year can start so that you can feel like, yes, I've got a new breath of fresh air or I've got some new energy. Or, or maybe you're not some of the, one of those people. Maybe you're just like me who at this stage, you're starting to, to breach the end of the year and you're starting to reflect on on life, on where you are, and, and what's going on in, in your own life. And I've, I've recently started thinking about my health again and just realizing that I'm feeling a bit sluggish, so maybe I need to do something to improve my, my sleep or my diet or maybe trying to exercise again. Um, I firmly believe I'm going to start exercising on a Monday. I just need to figure out which Monday. It might be tomorrow. Like, I'm really, I'm really going for it. I'll let you know next week. Um, but yes, and I'm serious about that because I, I realize that I need to do something because you can go through life and sometimes things can feel sluggish and sometimes things can feel off. And in, in me trying to, to work out all of this, um, I got to this point where I started looking for stuff to motivate me. I don't know who's ever been there. You're just like, let's just get the ball rolling, like type of thing. And I was thinking about, the, you know, about running again and I started thinking about comrades. Um, I haven't done the comrades, um, although I would really like to do that one day when I'm big. Um, but I was thinking about it, and there was something I remember when I first started running way back when. I saw a couple of clips about people f running across that finish line, and you can just see how they are tired. They are knackered. But they've got the smile, yet they're broken. And, and there's something about that beauty where you can just see all that preparation, all that hard work eventually paying off. And I've spoken to quite a few people who have done the comrades, and it's always the same thing. Right at the end of it, it's like, I'm never doing this again. And then that next morning, it's like, yo, when are we starting to train again? Like, I just need to give it a week or so, and then I need to, like, rest. There's, there's something addicting about that, about overcoming that challenge. And as I was thinking about that, I also saw another clip, um, which was not as beautiful. Let me just quickly turn off the clips, because for those who don't know, after 30 minutes, that thing goes off by itself if it doesn't have any audio, and then it's usually at the wrong time, and just get a fright to wake you up. Um, but I also saw another clip recently, and it was about the Barkley Marathon. Now, for those of you who don't know the Barkley Marathon, and it's okay, no one does, um, it's this very intense ultra marathon. Now, for those of you who don't know, the, the Comrades Marathon is an ultra marathon of about 94 Ks that you need to do running from either Peter Maritzburg to Durban and from, or from Durban to Peter Maritzburg. It's about 94 Ks that you need to do to do this whole route. Now, the Barclay Marathon is 160 kilometers. And it's a trail run, which means it's not on a nice smooth road. It's not, and I'm not saying the comrades is easy, but when you start comparing the two, that you see that there's, a, there's an obvious difference between the two. The other one, the Barclay Marathon, is a trail run that is done, like I said, 160 Ks, and is done in five loops of, 20, uh, of 32 kilometers that you need to complete. And just to make things interesting, there's no marked out routes. Like, there's not a trail that was made specifically for you. So you sort of have a map, literally a map, that you had to study, like, shortly before, and, and then you have to complete that within it. So you're bundu bashing, you're literally climbing up stuff, going through streams, it is horrible. Like, with the comrades, you have 12 hours to complete the whole thing. The Barclay Marathon, you have 12 hours to complete the first loop of 32 kilometers, just to sort of put it in perspective. Now, you need to do that twice clockwise, then twice anti-clockwise, just to confuse you. So now, you're going on like day two of little or no sleep. And then the person who is at front gets to choose whether the last loop is either going clockwise or anti-clockwise. This has been going on for over 30 years now, and there has only been 17 people who have completed it. Some of the best athletes in the world, people who do 100 and 200 kilometer races, try to get into this race. And I forgot to mention the one, the one special thing about this. Apart from the fact that there's no perfect trail, or it's not beautiful like that, with that race, the way to prove that you have been to all the designated points as you're circling around this foresty, up and hill, ridiculous course out of hell, you need to find hidden books. 
I'm not kidding. Hidden books in like these Ziploc bags and then you tear out a page and put it back. And now this goes through day and night. So you, it's sort of like by a bunch of stones or in a tree. Or, it sounds impossible, but obviously some people do it. Okay, some, some people complete it. So it is not impossible, but yet it is. Now back to the clip that I saw. You see this guy running, eventually getting to the yellow gate that is sort of like the poster child of this race where you start and finish. And he gets to this gate and then he drops and he's just dead. He's finished it. Six seconds short. 160 kilometers, years and years of training, short by six seconds. Doesn't work, doesn't get his medal. And by the way, you don't get a medal for this one. You just say that you finished it. Because it's not being advertised, it's sort of semi by invite only, people are not completely sure how you do it, but it's there. And he, and he, and he misses it by six seconds. And there's something about that that just sort of stuck with me. That you, you prepare for such a long time, yes, if, if you might, wouldn't mind, you prepare all this time and then you short by six seconds. Everything was for nothing. Everything. It was fun and you get the exhilaration and I'm very sure that you're fit after that. But like six seconds. Like how do you, how do, you do that? And by the way, this guy, it was his second time doing that. Last time he didn't complete. This time at least he managed to finish it. So people go back for it. People are suckers for punishment. Who here can sort of relate to at least to some degree? All the married people are going, shh, shh. if you raise your hand, I'll kill you. <laughs> but that got me thinking about that expectation that we have. You have this expectation and you're building towards wanting that gratification, that hope, that finish line. Now, let's leave that story aside. I quickly want to jump to the Jews, to the Jewish nation, if you will. Because for those of you who don't know, the Bible is such an interesting book. And it took me so many years to sort of figure this one thing out. But God created everything out of nothing. So he created the whole universe. The Bible focuses on everything and everyone. And Adam and Eve chose directly and indirectly to follow their own will and not God's will. And that sort of sent the world into the spiral of consequences because now they're not connected to God as they should have been. And because they were given authority over it, which they then subsequently gave over to Satan, everything went downhill from there. And then we see this promise that God made to them, like, don't worry, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get you. Like, it's fine. Like, just, just wait. I'm going to come and save you. And then that's in Genesis 3. Then in Genesis 6, or sorry, at 12... There's this new promise made to Abraham saying, like, through your seed, I'm going to save the world. Like, I'm going to create this opportunity. How everything works up until that point and even to where we are now, that's a whole different discussion. But in any case, there's this promise of God that I'm coming to save you. I'm, I'm, I'm coming to save you this whole time. So the, and this is when the Bible goes from focusing on everyone to focusing on this Jewish nation, which is essentially Abraham's descendants. So for those of you who are confused as I am, like... Why does it focus on this group of people who keep on messing up? That's why. <laughs> because through this messed up group of people that were chosen because of Abraham's faith, there's this expectation from them through promises and prophecies throughout like four and a half thousand years of just like waiting for this Messiah, waiting for this God sent person to save us out of misery and hell. And there's different types of prophecies. There are prophecies that speak about God's kingdom and authority. We sang some sing songs about God's kingdom and things, but yes, there's also some prophecies about his mercy. There are prophecies, and this is where it starts getting confusing. There are prophecies in the Old Testament where they speak about Jesus being born in Bethlehem, but yet he will be called a Nazarite, which is a different area, but yet he will also say that he will come from Egypt. Now, when you look at it at face value, it seems confusing. But then, when all of this is said and done, and you look back at Jesus' life, just fun fact, you realize that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, they fled to Egypt, and from there they, they went to, you know, to, to Nazareth. I meant to say Nazareth, but that's not right. Thank you, Chris. So we, 
in retrospect, you realize that all of this fits together perfectly. And there, there's a beauty in it, like a puzzle piece. Like, a, there's just beauty in that. But in any case, so you have this Jewish nation waiting for this long-waited Messiah, Messiah. And then you get to this point in time where God's just quiet for like 400 years. And then this carpenter's son gets born. And then he starts making all these proclamations about the kingdom of God and like it's here now and it's not. And, and, they, and they have this expectation that someone's going to come, overthrow this Roman rule over their life. Because even though they were a nation, they were controlled by the Romans. And that's where we get to sort of today's text. Now, for those of you who don't know, we like to work through books of the Bible, certain sections, to see the Bible and, and life as a whole. And currently we're in Luke and Luke 17. And I want to start reading from verse 20. And it says there, When he, speaking of Jesus, was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them. Now remember, the expectation is someone's going to come and just give them peace. This king like King David. This is, this is the expectation. Like I'm waiting for something to happen so that then I can do something. Okay, so last week at our morning service, which many of you missed because it was so early or you, you weren't a visitor yet, we spoke about how very often in life we have this expectation, we have this hope of something, and then once that happens, then I'll start. It's like me when I mentioned before, I'm going to start exercising on Monday. Um, you sort of wait for that. You keep on postponing. But then they ask him, like, when is this going to happen? Because then we can start living this kingdom life. And Jesus responded, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, here it is, or there it is. For remember, the kingdom of God is within you. Jesus, that, that doesn't make life difficult or easy for us. That, that sort of confuses us because we know that it's going to come and like it's, it's confusing. Now, it's interesting how Jesus' approach, those from without the circle, outside of the circle, essentially the Gentiles or essentially people who are not believers, his response to them was, stop waiting for that. The kingdom needs to be in you first. And then he carries on with his disciples. Then he said to his disciples, the days will come. So now you sort of say, it is going to come. It's within you, but it's also coming. Just to sort of confuse you like those prophecies. The days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man. Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man because there's a prophecy in the book of Daniel that speaks about this eternal king, about the coming Messiah. So this is how he's speaking in context to these people to make it clear to them, it's confusing to us, but it's clear to them that he's saying that he is the Messiah. The, and Messiah means the one who's come to save us all and to bring all things to perfection, if you will. The days will come when you will wish to see the Son of Man, but you will not see it. But they will say to you, this being people around you, look here or look there. Do not follow after them. For as lightning flashes and the lights up and lights up the heavens from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. So now he's making clear, there is something coming, but first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. So I just quickly want to bring us back to where we are now. So Jesus is saying the kingdom is God, of God is within you. We'll get back to that now. But he's also saying it is coming and there's going to be this special day that everyone will know. Like you will see it. Like you, you won't wonder about it. But first I need to suffer. Or he needs to suffer. The Messiah needs to suffer and be rejected. Meaning I first need to go to the cross. But now referring back to that final time. Not, not before the crucifixion. But just as in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and they were given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and then the flood came and destroyed them all. And there's something that we need to realize here. Number one, Jesus is making very clear that there's a judgment coming. Now for those of you who decided to visit this morning, I apologize. Obviously, God had other plans for you to hear this message because like I said, we work through the books of the Bible and I really feel that this is how God wants us to work in this message and, and in the season that we're in. But Jesus is making clear that there's coming a day of judgment. There's coming a finality. But at the same time, it's going to be like the days of Noah. Now when you start thinking about this, about the days of Noah, like they were eating and drinking and life was just carrying on. But yet there's something 
about that that just sort of sticks with me. Because they had the opportunity to go into the ark, but very much like today, people say, I'm not going to make a choice. While forgetting not making a choice is also the same as saying no to get into the ark. Very often we struggle with that because we say, I don't want to make a choice. All the parents here at one stage or another has felt that way. I don't know, maybe it's just me. Where I just get to the end of the day, I don't want to make a choice. Kiss it, choose it. Like I'm done, like I'm tired, like I'm not going to make a choice. But in not making a choice, I'm essentially choosing the opposite of yes. Essentially saying no. So he's making sure that this is going to happen. Continuing on from verse 28. Likewise, as it was in the days of Lot, they ate and drank and they bought and they sold and they planted and they built. Life will still carry on. But on that day, Lot departed from Sodom, and fire and brimstone rained from the heaven and destroyed them all. I want to pause there for a second because I very often forget about this. I actually had to reread that section again because I know about Lot. And I've read it, but it, it, it doesn't make sense. Now, for those of you who don't know, Lot is Abraham's sort of nephew, family person type thing. Now, for him in his city, they were so evil. We need to stress this. The people of that day were so evil, Lot had angel visitors, and Lot knew that. So you had these angelic beings at Lot's house. Let's pretend, just imagine in your house. You're in your house. You have these visitors. You know that they're angels. You know that they might be God or something, but they're supernatural, and you have these visitors. And suddenly, as we see in Lot, like the whole village, it's easier for us to imagine than in the big city, but a whole group of the village just comes and starts banging on the door and saying, listen, we want to have sex with your visitors. Now. Like, that, what do you do? Like, these people are literally, this mob is trying to break down your house. And, and Lot, I don't know, in this moment of realizing who his visitors are, offers up his daughters to say, listen, take them, just don't take them, because he knows the judgment from God will be ten times worse. Like he, It's not saying that he doesn't care or, or he's a broken person. He's just realizing that who's with him, the consequences will be so much greater. And I don't want to get stuck there, but we need to realize how evil these people were. And then these angelic beings basically made the people outside blind and confused them, and they went away, and it was this chaos. But then they, they sort of went away and they, they, they escaped. We need to picture this because very often we think our world is evil. We do. Like, look around us. Look at the government. Look at crime. Look at, like, most of us at some stage or another have at least come from or have visited Joburg. And, and you don't have the pictures that you took because you lost your phone. But <laughs> you need to realize that there's something different in that time. We need to realize that this, it doesn't matter how evil you think this generation is. That was worse. And fire and brimstone rained from heaven and destroyed them all. Verse 30. So will it be on the day of the, when the Son of Man is revealed. On the day, let him who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down to take them away. Focusing, it's Middle Eastern times, you, there's stairs on the outside and things like, stop trying to save your stuff, which is what he's saying. And likewise, let him who is in the field not return to, to the things behind. Remember Lot's wife. For those of you who don't know, while they were fleeing, Lot's wife looked at everything that she lost. And as she looked back, after she got a very clear instruction from the angel, don't look back, she looked back and she became a pillar of salt. But yet, for some reason, as we live our Christian life, very often we think about the stuff that we lost instead of thinking about the stuff that we're gaining. And he's saying we need to realize what we are being saved from. Verse 33, whoever seeks his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you that on, the, on that night, two men will be in bed, not in the same bed. Two men, will be in, uh, sorry, two men will be in one bed, the other will be taken, and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together, grain, will be grinding grain together, and the one will be taken and the other one will be left. Two men will be in the field, and one will be taken and the other one will be left. They asked, Lord, he replied, Where, uh, Lord, where, Lord, 
And he replied, where the body is, there the eagles will be gathered also. Or will be gathered together. There's something that we need to stress here. Number one, Jesus speaks about those being in bed while also those being in the field. That shows that God had, Jesus, God, had a very interesting understanding of how the world works. Because back then, I don't think that they realized that if you're in China and if you're in America, the one is day and the other one is night. That's not something that was common knowledge back then. Number one, that just, that's just an interesting fact, by the way, that I find very interesting. But what is Jesus saying in all of this? And I think this is important for us to remember. He's saying the end is coming and we need to be prepared and we need to understand that it's going to happen like this. And it sort of brings me back to that race that I was speaking about in the beginning. Those people with everything in them were preparing for the last four years. I think about when we watched the rugby and my dad after the, after the match said, for those of you who don't know, we won the Rugby World Cup. Woohoo! Um, any case, after that game, you, you think about the opponents and you think for the last four years and more, their entire lives, everything that they worked for was for that moment. And now they lost it. I don't want to get stuck in the rugby, but you, you're sort of focusing on this one point. But yet for some reason we miss that our entire lives and our entire being is for that point of death. Whether it's before we actually die when we give our lives to Christ, or whether it is when Jesus returns or when it is that we die. Yesterday I was at a bri, birthday bri, and, and we were speaking to someone, and then a friend of mine mentioned how he just found out that a friend of his just committed suicide. And you realize how quickly the end comes. You realize how, how short and fleeting life is. We're so concerned about the stuff that we're building towards, whether it be our business or our sport or our health or our marriage or our children. I'm, I just want to get to this point. While forgetting, nothing compares to that end point. Nothing compares to whether we're really accepting Jesus or not. Because what, what scares me, and I can be honest, I don't want to miss heaven by the metaphorical six seconds. Because I was busy with that one thing. Because I was looking back just a touch for that one thing like Lot's wife. There's something in that that scares me. And you're saying, Johan, like, that's all good and well, but what am I going to do with this message? Well, I want to bring us back to that first part where Jesus spoke to the people around them and he said, the kingdom of God is now. There's something that we forget when we start thinking about what does it mean to have the kingdom of God in us, but also among us. In this life, we have the opportunity. I, I, I don't know how to express it more because I'm not that type of expressive person, but there's something so beautiful. We have the opportunity to experience samples, if you will, of God working in our lives now where we see God giving us hope. We see God giving us peace despite the, besides the, um, inside the storm. We see God being able to manifest His power through miracles, through giftings that He has given us, all of us. He's given us something to glorify Him. He's given us that opportunity to experience Him even in this life and so much more in the next. Saying, Johan, but that's all good and well, but now I'm continuously scared. Well, I'm going to tell you, and I want to motivate you in this, that that's a good thing. Now, for those of you who don't know, this Bible is essentially divided into two parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament, when they were still waiting for the Messiah, and the New Testament, when they received Him. And the, old, the, the difference between the two, and we very often struggle, we, we're Christians, but no one tells us these things. We're, we're expected to know the Christianese. And... I struggled with that because when I first became a Christian, I really felt stupid. I don't know if any of you have ever felt that way. Like people would say stuff and I'd be, yes, yes. No idea what they just said. Like no idea. So you would start asking questions. And, and then you start realizing the Old Testament was God telling them, if you do this, then I will do this. Okay, you listen and I will do this. But then the New Testament comes as, as, he, as he gave it through Abraham. You couldn't do that, so I will, so that you can. It's very much like a parent. Like, you don't have money, but I'll pay for you so that you can do it. But you, but you need to accept it. If you don't accept it, like, you can't get the product. You, you need to unwrap it. But now, getting back to the New Testament, 
The first four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, tells us about the story of Jesus. The remaining books, if you will, are letters written to different churches. Most of them are written by a guy named Paul. Paul used to be Saul until he changed his name. Well, until the Lord changed his name. But in any case, two-thirds of the New Testament is written by this person who first, at first, persecuted the church. He hated the church. He literally asked if you could kill Christians. This is Paul. But then the Lord appears to him, the sinner, this person who hates the church. He appears to him and he said, why are you persecuting me? Which is a message by itself. But realizing when he was persecuting the church, when he was trying to kill the church, Jesus took it personally. But now, getting back to this message, and I really want us to focus on this. This person was greeted and converted by Jesus himself. He started and planted churches throughout the entire world, areas like this. And then Paul gets to the section where he's writing to the Philippians who are going through difficult times, and he writes to them, Paul, I can't stress this enough. You start speaking about salvation and how we are saved through grace, through faith. But then he gets to this point in verse 12, Philippians 3 verse 12. Not that I have already attained or have already been perfected. Paul still has a little bit of a doubt. And a good one. But I follow after it so that I may lay a hold of which I was seized by Christ. For which... um, so that I may lay hold of that for which I was seized by Christ Jesus. Yes, I'm not going to preach and pretend like I'm already arrived, like I'm not perfect, I haven't gotten my glorified body and all of that and all of that. But yet I'm reaching forward. Brothers, I do not count myself to have attained, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind me, reaching forward to those things which are ahead. This is what we are called for. All of us have sat there and I'm thinking, everyone else but me. Like Jesus can forgive everyone, but I remember that one thing multiple times. Or I did this. I'm so useless. Or my parents. Or this history. Or I keep on struggling. Or I get stuck there. But Paul is saying, forget about that. Move on. I press forward to the goal of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let those of us who are mature be thus minded. We should all be of one mind. And you think differently in any way. And if any of you think differently, I don't know why I can't read today. I apologize. And if you think differently in any way, God reveal even this to you. He's saying, like, listen, if you don't agree, may God reveal this to you. And this is really my prayer for us this morning. May God open this up for us, this reality that he has died for us. And may we never be complacent, but may God reveal to us that we're striving towards something, very much like that race I mentioned in the beginning. Nevertheless, according to what we have already attained, so that which God has already given you, let us walk by the same rule and let us be of one mind. Brothers, Become fellow imitators with me and observe those who walk according to our example. He's saying, and all of us should be able to say this, follow in my example. Not being prideful, but may we strive to live according to God's calling on our lives. And then here's this thing that very seldomly is preached in church. For many are walking in such a way that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. It's so easy for us to think about, yes, these are unbelievers. No, no. He's speaking about those who think that they are saved. They are enemies of Christ. I have told you of them often, and I tell you again, even weeping, their destination is destruction. Their God is their appetite, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, from where we also await our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our body of humiliation so that we may be conformed to His glorious body according to the workings of His power, even to subdue all things to Himself. I think this is the heaviest message that I've preached ever. But there's something in here that I feel that God wants to press on our hearts. 
we need to realize that regardless of whether you're acknowledging it or not, like in the days of Noah, whether they're laughing at this guy building a boat or not, whether we like it or not, we're in this race. And we can either decide to finish it and be at the finish line where God wants us. Or we can slack off and be where we're not. And the way that we do that is through, and I thought about this this morning, the way that we are to live our lives is to run this race of life towards the finish line of the kingdom, while at the same time knowing that every single step we take, we extend His kingdom, not only in our lives, but in the world around us. That's how we balance these two. We need to realize that every single thing we do not only makes a difference in our life, but in the lives of those around us. Are we bringing glory to God or are we bringing glory to the world and ourselves? And I've, I want to be encouraged by this because I saw that thing this morning and we were sort of trying to figure out whether we should put it on the board or not, whether we will offend or will it be taken out of context. But people very often say, YOLO, you only live once. Just kidding. Be right back. Jesus. <laughs> and there's something in that that I, I feel that we need to understand. Like, there's something so much greater waiting for us. Like, there's no disrespect meant by that. It's really, it's, it's trying to highlight, like, there's a life greater than the one that we're living now. One without the pain, without the suffering. And once you acknowledge it, once you accept it, what Jesus meant when he said the kingdom of God is within you, the word kingdom, and I don't want to get too technical or, or use big words, but I, I, I can't not do it. Having the kingdom of God within you is having his power made manifest within you outside because suddenly you're empowered to live the life that he has purposed you for, whether it is to love someone, whether it is to forgive someone, whether it is to speak at the front or to prophesy or to heal. These gifts are among us because that's how God created you. But some people are sitting and waiting and waiting for the race to finish despite the fact that we realize that we need to be at the finish line. So may we be encouraged by this because I want to encourage you with Paul, like even he's stressed. So if you think you're stressing, that's fine. It's not a problem. But what we need to do is realize Jesus did something for us and now we just need to strive forward. We need to realize, and I can't say this enough, God forgave every single one of us if we choose to accept it. It's done. Now we have the opportunity, not just the responsibility, but to live better. Not perfect. We're, stri we're striving for perfect. But now I just want, Lord, lead me. Like I'll do that. Because if we put the kingdom of God first, then everything else will be added unto us. And with that, I really want to close. And I just want to pray that God opens up this reality in our lives, that it does, that is not this heavy message, but that we start realizing the truth behind it. Because I think for far too long, the church and Christians have been sharing this gospel of, if you believe in Jesus, then you'll be saved, and all of that is fine, without the responsibility of having to continue the race. Acknowledging the fact that we have something to live for. And there's joy in that. There really is when you start realizing, I'm not going to hell. I, I don't know how else to put it. Like I'm trying to be politically correct and sensitive. But that's what it is. Because all of us can have it. It's not something, do it's just that mindset shift of saying, yes, I'm dead. I'm not going to try and do stuff my own. Because the amount of times that I've spoken to people, I'll get to church when I sort the stuff out. You'll never do it. Your heart might be right in trying to do it, but you're not. That's why we need Jesus. It's so lucky when someone just does that something for you. I'm going to close again with the final illustration. And then I'm really done. I remember the first time Sophia and I ever had help in this house. Like we had a gardener and a cleaning lady for the first time ever. Like you, we've been adults for quite some time. Then we moved in here and one day we were like, listen, we just need someone once. And I remember, I don't know, maybe I'm being useless, but at one stage we, we sort of got together in the bedroom. It was like, this is awesome. <laughs> and and it, I felt so stupid. But I got in that bedroom like, this is so awesome. Like, the garden is looking better and I didn't do anything. And so it feels like, I know the dishes are done. And I know, I know all of us are used to it now, but there's something in realizing it's done. 
But yet for some reason when it comes to our Christian faith, we, we struggle to acknowledge that. It's done. May we live in that. And not thinking, oh, the judgment's coming, what do I need to do? It's done. And because you do that, then suddenly everything else starts becoming simpler. And you're empowered to do it. That's my prayer for us this morning. So for all of us who believe, may we continue reaching for that what's forward. And if there's anyone here today who is unsure, who, who feels that they need to give their life to Jesus and, and take on this new role, please come speak to me. I don't want to do that whole awkward, let's close our eyes and raise your eyes and all the Christians go like this. Like, I, I want to encourage you, like, take that step of faith and just come speak to, or speak to someone around you and say, listen, what, what he was speaking about, I want that. Like, I want to go with you and, and say it's done. Because that's what Jesus did for us. Because he loves us. Let's close our eyes and pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I want to say thank you for this morning. Thank you for encouraging us with this heavy, but yet so true message, Lord. Help us get to grips with what this means, Lord. Help us not get distracted by the world, Lord. Help us not distract ourselves. I pray that we don't overcomplicate things. I pray that we don't fail ourselves before we even start, Lord, and just cling on for dear life to you, Lord. I pray that you change our lives, O oh Lord, and through us, let us change Bathus, Lord, for your kingdom's sake, Lord. Help us carry each other through that or over that finish line in time, Lord, before it's too late. There are so many running this race of life with us, Lord, and all they need is a little bit of oomph that you can do it to give them that new energy, that, that second breath, Lord. I pray that you use us to encourage those around us, Lord, so that we can finish this race in time, Lord. I pray that you go with us in this week. And I thank you for your love, Lord. Amen.